Hello, everyone, and welcome to Youth Positively Speaking. My name is Paige Ewing, and I work at Prevention Resources as the Multimedia Specialist for Positive Youth. Prevention Resources is a nonprofit located in New Jersey that is dedicated to promoting health and wellness of individuals, families, and community through education, collaboration, advocacy, and treatment. As always, I have with me Erin Cohen, the Project Coordinator of Positive Youth, and my co-host. Thanks, Paige. And the Positive Youth Initiative focuses on building countywide capacity to reduce substance misuse for youth ages 9 to 20 here in Hunterdon County. So today we are joined by our two featured youth members, Jasmine and Alyssa. So welcome back to the podcast, Jasmine. Why don't you go first, introduce yourself for people who might not know you. Yes. So hi, my name is Jasmine and I'm a senior in high school. This is actually my third podcast with Youth Positively Speaking. I'm the president of the choir group at my school, and I'm the president of the Incorruptible Us chapter at my school. Which is super awesome. And we also have with us a newbie to the podcast, Alyssa. So welcome to the podcast and introduce yourself for everybody. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Alyssa. I'm a sophomore in high school. And I'm recently the new secretary of my SAD club at my high school. Which is also super cool to have two big involved leaders of their youth groups. And so today as our expert, we have Michelle with us, who is the national director of tobacco programs at the American Lung Association. So a little bit about the American Lung Association for more than 115 years, the American Lung Association's mission has been to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease through education, advocacy, and research. And today their goals are really big to defeat lung cancer, create a tobacco free future, champion clean air for all and improve the quality of life for those living with lung disease. So we are super excited to have you on the podcast today, Michelle. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So this episode is coming out in November and in one week on November 18th is the Great American Smokeout. And so for those of you who might not have ever heard about this, this um, event is um, hosted by the American Cancer Society. And it's an opportunity for people who smoke to commit to healthy smoke-free lives, not just for a day, but year round. And so this event really provides an opportunity for individuals, community groups, businesses, healthcare providers, and others to encourage people to use the date to make a plan to quit or plan in advance and initiate smoking cessation plan for the day of the actual event. So this event really challenges people to stop smoking and helps people learn about the many tools they can use to help them quit and stay quit. Um, and so with that event coming up, we really wanted to have a conversation about the vaping epidemic in our schools, about tobacco and vaping policy, um, and just why this is so harmful for the lung health of our youth. So Michelle, could you tell us a little bit about, in general, the vaping epidemic that we have in our schools? Sure, sure. We are seeing a tremendous number, at least one out of four youth that are vaping. And of course, that's, you know, it, it, it's been creeping up on us and certainly is something to be concerned about. There's a lot of misinformation out there on the part of teens that, that start to use vaping products, um, maybe not understanding the true harms that may come their way. Um, I think there's some mistruths and misunderstanding even on the part of, of parents and, and adults that don't know the true, um, true harms that can happen. So um, our, our emphasis is getting the word out, but also helping people to be able to quit when, when they're ready to provide some intervention for those that are addicted and uh, to be able to prevent people from starting to, to use tobacco products in the first place. And you know, Michelle, I want to tell you that here in Hunterdon County, a couple years ago, we had so many superintendents and principals coming to us and saying to us, vaping is out of control. We need help. There are kids all over the bathrooms. This is becoming a huge issue. That became the number one issue here in our county when it comes came to substances was vaping. So really, Alyssa and Jasmine, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you see in your school, what you're seeing when you're just around, um, if you're hanging out with friends, if you're going to parties, if you're walking by the park, what are you all seeing? Yeah, so I can speak on this. 
Um, in my school, sometimes I see these people going to the bathroom quite often. We have one class together and I see them go to the bathroom every day. And then, you know, after school, I'm like going through my social media account and I look at the timestamp that one, then when my friend went to the bathroom and in like this video that they posted on their social media, it's them vaping in the bathroom. So I'm just like, wow, like you're going to the bathroom every day, but really you're just vaping. And my school did, is trying to stop it because now they have students signing into the bathroom and they have a security guard sitting outside the bathroom. And after like three or so minutes after that person went in, they'll knock on the stall or knock on the door and tell them, okay, now it's time to get out. But my issue with that is kind of having a security guard like knocking on the doors in the bathroom is an invasion of privacy. And I do understand what my school is trying to do to put a stop to this vaping epidemic. But again, I feel like there's could be a more effective way of stopping students from using these substances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa, Alyssa, what are you seeing in your school? Um, I'm seeing a very similar issue in my school too, but um, my school has been starting to implement um, little measures to kind of make sure the student body is uh, sober during the day and has a clear mind. We're working towards fixing the issue. Mm -hmm. And I think even Michelle, what you were talking about with educating parents and educating teens about these dangers of vaping. Um, I remember a couple years ago, when we were doing a lot of um, vaping programs, parents didn't realize that there was harm in it because they're thinking, oh, it's just, it's vaping, it's not smoking, they're not smoking, so that's good. Because the reality, Michelle, right, is that um, tobacco use by smoking has gone down over the years. I always right. talk about, when you talk about prevention programming working, right. um, we got a new generation not smoking. Right. right, right, but then you're seeing those vaping rates go up tremendously. Right, and and you know to your point um, when you were talking about the school seeing a, a need for it and and the need for some some education, the Lung Association has a program called In Depth, which there's a long name for it. It's Intervention for Nicotine Prevention Education uh, Dependence Tobacco and Health. I said that all wrong. And <laughs> anyway, we call it In Depth. The in-depth program is an intervention program or an alternative to suspension program. So the whole idea behind in-depth is that it allows when a student gets caught, instead of punishing them, suspending them, and causing them to be removed from a situation where they can be at home and vape as much as they want, it provides an opportunity to provide some education and help them de develop a quit plan so that they can take steps to become tobacco free when they're ready. So we think it's really important for schools to know that there are resources out there instead of punitive approaches that can be an alternative to suspension like the in-depth program. And that's actually something that we're doing here in Hunterdon County. I mean, Jasmine, kind of to your point, you know, it's like once they are in it in high school, it's really hard to stop. So how do we get them to not even start once they're in high school? And so um, we've actually installed vape disposal boxes in all of our county high schools, but also in some of the middle schools um, and with quit resources right there on a big poster right on the um, box and also the QR code to our help app, which also also has quit resources on it um, so that we're catching those kids who might be using early and middle school and then definitely um, helping those kids get the resources that are definitely using in high school. Um, so hopefully some of these earlier measures will help educate the students so that when the peer pressure comes from cool high schoolers and things like that, um, they're less likely to use because they know the risks. Great idea. Mm -hmm. And even a couple of years ago, um, when we had these take back your vape events right before COVID hit, um, we had a principal who came through and said, you know, it's out of control. I have a drawer full of vapes from taking it away. And he said, what if we did some sort of like take back your vape event? And we figured out a way to do it where again, no consequences, like what you were talking about. We didn't have any school personnel. Our agency came in and we had no idea if it would work or not. Would kids come? Would they not come? We incentivized them. And it was funny because it took the kids a little bit of time to 
realized that it wasn't a trap. <laughs> and once the word got around the school, the first event that we had, we collected over 59 vapes from kids. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like 80 different pods and we had bottles of vape juice. And I mean, it ended up being very successful and we did it actually at another school later that was a little bit more successful. And then of course COVID hit. So mm -hmm. it's been interesting because the pulse of vaping we weren't really even sure what was happening last year during COVID because right. all the kids were at home. So now we're starting to see, and even my two high schoolers um, tell me that it's still a huge issue, you know, same thing in the bathrooms, they're seeing it, they're seeing kids doing it. And so that's a huge issue. <laughs> it's still a huge issue. And Alyssa and Jasmine, like you said, I mean, it's got to be difficult when you're in school and you want to use the restroom because you need to use the restroom. And there's the whole issue of somebody being there and, and what else is going on inside of there or having security outside. It's not the way things used to be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely and, not. And I think that's that's the struggle is that so many people don't know what's, what's in a vape. Um, and so they think that it's just water vapor and that it's cool. And um, they have no idea that there's nicotine um, in those products. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about, about like nicotine, Michelle? Like, what is it? Why is it so addictive? What does it do to your body? Sure, sure. Well, nicotine is the addictive chemical that's found in all tobacco products and, and, e and many of the e-cigarettes that even say, you know, the, the e-juice may say that it's nicotine free. And oftentimes the, the lab results have shown that there are small amounts of nicotine that's in there. It's a, a chemical that alters the way your brain functions. And it means that your body kind of reacts in a way that it continues to need it. It's addicted to it. So um, and it can impact, you know, brain development for, especially for our young youth um, or for our youth, um, it, it can impact your attention span, your, your learning processes, your mood and your impulse control. So there are a lot of, a lot of implications of, of what can happen when somebody is using nicotine, particularly when they start early. And I guess I would emphasize that, you know, if the choice is to never start, that's the smartest choice because a lot of people think I'll try it once it'll be, you know, and, and, you know, it, it, I, if I don't like it, I won't do it. And then they try it once and once becomes twice and twice becomes a few more times. And before they know it, they're addicted. And that addiction is difficult to overcome. Again, it's a change in the brain's chemistry. So it's not as if you can just turn it on and off like a light switch. Um, and that's why it's important to have, you know, support for somebody who's trying to quit to be able to, you know, go through some behavior modification and learn some skills to be able to, to resist. It's not just a matter of I picked it up and I'll put it back down and I'm done with it. Your body says, I still need the nicotine. Yes. And one thing I can remember that was the biggest shock to me about nicotine was that it gets to your brain from the time you inhale to the time it gets to your brain and hits your brain is seven seconds. Right. So it's immediate, but then it goes away very quickly as well. And that's why we have people who are chain smoking or chain vaping. Is that the term even chain right. vaping, well, but where they're taking puff after puff, because as quickly as it gets there, it's gone. And then your body is saying, I want some more. And one of the things that we try to do with prevention messaging with our kids is that you don't know at what point that you're going to become addicted to it because here's the reality of the situation and Alyssa and Jasmine I think you can agree with me on this is that no kid is vaping or smoking in their bedroom for the very first time they're not just doing it off alone by themselves they're in a group they're with friends somebody says hey do you want to try this but what happens with being curious or experimental and trying it then will lead, like you said, Michelle, to more, um, more use. And then the next step is then they're in their bedroom or going behind the garage or somewhere to do it because now your body wants it. And it's difficult really to measure when, we, when, when people were smoking before, a lot of times you could measure by number of cigarettes that you smoked or how many packs you smoked or over what period of time. 
Now with a lot of the devices, it's difficult, you know, depending on how deeply they inhale or how big of a drag that they take off of their, their vaping product or, you know, there, there are, some, um, are some things that, you know, are, are difficult to measure. You could maybe go buy cartridges, but what less, you know, what one cartridge that might last one person a couple of days, maybe another person is going through a cartridge a day. So that's close, but e-liquids, you know, the measurement is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And the response to the nicotine, of course, is different from person to person as well. But it, it can be really difficult to measure like, well, I don't really use it all that often. Well, what does all that often mean? Right, right. And, and when you said about how difficult it is to quit, you know, stopping smoking or stopping a nicotine addiction, whether it's vaping or whether it's smoking, is harder than stopping heroin. Mm -hmm. And and when I tell kids that, they tend to be really surprised by me saying that. And I, I often say now it seems to be grandparents more than parents, you know, but at, in my age growing up, both of my parents smoked and it was very, very hard for them to quit. And um, now, you know, kids, it might be grandparents, but I'll say to them, do you, has your grandparents, you know, has your grandpa ever tried to quit smoking? And then kids will say, oh yeah. And then he was in a really bad mood and he was really irritable. And then that's when, you know, it's a great way to explain, yes, this is what happens. And these are the signs of withdrawal. And it is very, very difficult to stop. And I think it's so interesting because when I was in high school, vaping was just kind of starting. Like when I was leaving high school, people were like, Ooh, this is the new thing. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I graduated high school in 2016. So like 2014, I feel like was the time that it was becoming that's, like super cool. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, we never really got like any education in school about vaping because it was brand new and nobody knew what it was. So now that it's been around for longer, Jasmine and Alyssa, do you guys like get an education about it in health class? when you guys like do your drug unit or is it still like not really talked about to add on to what you guys are saying about like vaping being this new thing I remember when I was like little and maybe in like elementary middle school I remember hearing on the radio like oh these new e-cigarettes that look like cigarettes help you quit and I remember it was just like this fake advertising which probably wasn't true just to get people hooked in I was like hmm this sounds interesting and I remember that was kind of like my first introduction to e-cigarettes in my school, um, we used to have the speaker Rob Holiday um, come to our school. Well, he only came once, but I thought his um, presentation was really interesting. We haven't done like any speakers since COVID has happened, but we did start an Incorruptible Us Club at our school. And we're just trying to, you know, remind kids that it's not okay to vape. But in terms of like a concrete, like education on vaping, that doesn't exist in the curriculum at my school. And what about you, Alyssa? Um, my health class in middle school is actually when the whole um, unit on drug use and abuse started. We went in depth with using physical models and activities with clay and speaking with people who were ex-drug uh, users. Mm -hmm. And they now um, come in and give personal experiences, stories, um, resources, and it's a very beneficial experience. Um, but so far in my high school, um, maybe it's because of COVID delaying things. We haven't really gotten into like the meat of uh, the topic, but just kind of skimmed the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I think that's so, know. yeah, I know. I'm like, I think that's so interesting because it's like, teachers and stuff are putting hall monitors in front of the bathrooms, except then you're not teaching it in, you know, health class, I would say, just because they have the unit on drugs. So it would make sense that it's like, this is a drug that you're seeing all the time, because just to reinform everybody, it's illegal for them to buy these. It's not like they're allowed to have them because they're considered a tobacco product. And here in New Jersey, you have to be over 21 to buy that product. And it well, is a drug. Nicotine is a drug, just mm -hmm. like any other it is. And people don't like to admit that, that nicotine is a drug, but it alters the brain. So therefore it's a drug. And one thing too, Michelle, with, um, since you don't live in New Jersey here, 
is where our Hunterdon County is located, we border Pennsylvania. And thankfully, when Tobacco 21 just happened and they raised the national age to 21, that actually helped us here in Hunterdon County because at the time, New Jersey was 21, but Pennsylvania was 18. That's so kind of level playing field. Yeah. Yep. So they would just go right across the bridge. Then we would be in Pennsylvania and then come right back over. But with it being moved to 21, that has helped tremendously with the access for us. Sure, sure. I was I was just going to talk a little bit. I would love to hear from Alyssa and Jasmine about access and where, if, if it's not legal to be able to purchase it before the age of 21, are you aware of where people are getting their, their vape products from? And, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. In my community, people usually turn to this one older person for like drugs or alcohol or nicotine because he physically looks like an adult, like over 21. So whenever he goes to these establishments, people never ask for an ID or mm -hmm. ask him, oh, like, can I see that you're over 21? And he just buys these products. And he was saying like, oh, like, oh, I get upset that people don't pay me back. But it's like in the first place, he shouldn't even be buying these products. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people really turn to him specifically for those products. Not only that, but people in my grade, I'm a senior, they sell in their Snapchats like, hey, I have these two. I, I remember like this week, I saw someone selling in two bags of like edible like snacks, like, oh, two for 70, slide up if you want to buy some. And I'm just like, why are you doing this? And it's like, people just don't know them. They can be tracked down to this. Like I could take a screenshot and easily send it to the principal. Like, I don't know why people think that they're safe posting it on their social medias. I mean, even the person that you said was posting a picture of them vaping, um, just posting a picture, maybe not that they're selling it, but that they're using it at all could get them kicked off their sports team out of their clubs. Mm -hmm. I mean, a college could see that and be like, hmm, maybe we don't want to offer admission to this person because they're using a substance illegally in high school. So they'll probably still be doing it at our university. Mm -hmm. um, well, following what Jasmine said, um, at my school, um, it's typically friends of friends that have all their siblings who know a person. So it's kind of just falling down this whole train of who has access to what. And um, unfortunately, it always kind of narrows down into the impoverished parts of where we live that people most often find access or unregulated um, places to buy these things. Um, and uh, it, it's like a growing thing is, I don't know. <laughs> so when people use substances, whether it's nicotine, whether it's marijuana, whether it's alcohol to cope with stress. And I can remember, you know, myself growing up and people saying, you know, oh my God, I'm so stressed out. I need a cigarette or, you know, now you see the kids saying that they need to go out and vape or young people in general, when I say kids, it could be someone in their mid twenties, you know, wanting to go out and vape to get that stress. It's, you know, so we talk a lot about coping skills and trying to figure out ways to manage stress in healthy ways, opposed to doing this. And, you know, Paige, you and I were talking earlier about, you know, some of the statistics out there um, with youth and people who are using tobacco and, you know, let, let me see here. You know, I always have to try to find some of my um, statistics here. So this came from the CDC and it says, if cigarette smoking continues at the current rate among youth in this country, 5.6 million of today's Americans younger than 18 will die early from a smoking related illness. So that's about one in every 13 Americans age 17 or younger who are alive today. So that's pretty scary. That's a huge number, 5.6 million. And I think there's that misconception out there, even when Jasmine, you were talking about when those vapes first came out and the e-cigarettes first came out and they looked like cigarettes. I, I tend to, when I do prevention programs about vaping, I show the vapes and how e-cigarettes have changed through the years. So they used to look exactly like a cigarette. 
And the reason that they don't look like a cigarette anymore is because there's a stigma around smoking now. So they don't want it to look like smoking. They don't want it to look like a cigarette. In fact, they're very tech kind of savvy too. They look yeah. like a USB drive or they look like something kind of fun, different, like not what my parents or my grandparents would use, but yeah, because that's that bad. just for us yep. that, you know, it's kind of trendy and, you know, feels like it's cool and it's something different and it's technology and nobody will even know we're using it because it's easy to conceal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Drive. And I think that's what was really happening when it first hit the scene was that people didn't realize, you know, it looked like a USB drive in the side of a computer. So a teacher could walk by, a parent could walk by and didn't know what they were looking at. And, you know, and they're small, they're mm-hmm. small and they can be hidden. And so, yeah, they, they have changed so much. And we even in this field have a hard time following how quickly it's changing. Right, right. right. The other thing I want to add to that, Erin, is, is the flavors. That, that is a huge, huge um, reason that youth start to use it because they're in fun kind of, you know, fruity or fun flavors or even, even the menthol or the mint flavors. Mm -hmm. Most of those flavors are not meant to target somebody who, you know, back in the day when they were first introduced as, you know, for people to try try to quit. Most teens who wouldn't have picked up a cigarette are not going to pick up a tobacco flavored e-cigarette, but they will pick up one that's minty or that's fruity or, you know, that seems a little more fun. Jasmine, I see you nodding your head. (laughs) Yeah. Do you see the flavors out there quite a bit? Yeah, for sure. And even with my little sister, I hear sometimes saying that, oh, and she's in middle school. I hear her saying that, oh, her friends, they went to the bathroom and they smelled fruit as they went to just like wash their hands or something. And I'm just like, well, this is happening. And definitely, I feel like it's more common that people will use the fruit flavors as opposed to like the mint or menthol flavor that's offered. For sure. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's why we've had, you know, big pushes from state and national policies, especially when, you know, Juul was so popular Mm -hmm. um, to ban those flavors, because when it's like lollipop and like, that's for kids, that's for youth. That's not, you know, grandma who, you know, whatever, she's not going to want fruity tooty, you know, blue, blue, whatever, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) that's not what she's going to grab. It's going to be the high schooler. Who's like, Ooh, that looks cool. Um, And it probably legitimately tastes good. I mean, it, it probably tastes pretty good if it's a flavor like that. Mm -hmm. So Michelle, can you tell us a little bit more about some more of these like tobacco and vaping policy updates that have been um, coming out? I know that the um, American Lung Association just released um, some information about views. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So the FDA has been, um, it's been kind of in the works now for a while for them to be able to monitor what is being released on the market and what's okay. And all of the tobacco industry, uh, including e-cigarettes needed to submit their products for review by the FDA. Uh, Recently, the the FDA announced that it authorized the marketing application for VUSE, which is an e-cigarette product. And that, that product, um, while they only released or authorized the release for marketing for the tobacco, tobacco flavored version, they didn't touch the other ones yet. Um, it's concerning because it's a, a owned by a large um, tobacco company. And um, you know that almost gives the, the thumbs up and the okay for the continued marketing of that. We know that outside of Juul, um, disposables are increasingly being used, and those are still under vetting or under consideration by the FDA. Uh, but Views is the second most popular behind those products, um, and and so that means our, our youth are going to continue to have access to those when we would hope that the FDA would 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 block that. Mm-hmm. Um, we continue to to look at flavors, and in particular, menthol is as a major issue because we know that that's what's enticing our youth. So policy-wise, that's you know, really, really important for us to continue to work towards policies that address that. We have you know, in, in a number of different communities, approaches of, of developing comprehensive uh, tobacco-free policies with flavors included. So n- mm-hmm. no longer allowing the sale of flavors. 
Um, and of course, our, our smoke-free air laws, whatever we can do to enhance those, um, those laws and, and local ordinances, you know, in indoor, uh, indoor spaces, certainly, but now we're looking at, you know, public spaces as well, beaches, parks, and other places mm -hmm. that people commonly in, enjoy and want to, you know, be able to enjoy them as being places that are tobacco free. Mm -hmm. And I, and when you say tobacco free, that's both smoking and vaping, because I think so many times, and now we've started here, um, where we actually put vaping and smoking because people, right. when they think about tobacco, mm -hmm. they don't think about vaping. And so you'll still see people vaping and, you know, it's tobacco they and they think it's okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Because I know, you know, if I'm at a, one of my kids' baseball games and somebody starts smoking a cigarette, it's very, you know, you know, someone's smoking a cigarette, right. but you can discreetly hide vaping. I mean, you can vape discreetly because the smell might be a little different. It's not as that invasive smell, you know, but yeah, we've, we've done a lot of that with the clean air at our parks and have signage up, but we definitely try to um, specify vaping and smoking. And that communication is important because I think the perception, um, you know, for, for, for us that are in the kind of prevention and public health field, we say tobacco, we know that includes vaping. Right. But for the general public, there are a lot of people that, that hear smoking and they're like, that doesn't include vaping, that's different. Or right. they hear vaping and go, well, that's not really smoking. It's not, it is, they are both tobacco products. So it's important mm -hmm. to, to make sure that we're, when we're including those policies, we're, we're very clear about what those definitions are. And that's why here at Prevention Resources, um, we offer tobacco cessation programming. We actually now have three certified tobacco treatment specialists on staff um, because, you know, people are calling us and their parents, kids, friends, they're all calling us and they're like, my kid has a problem. They can't stop. Um, what do I do? Um, and so now we have three people on staff who can help people go through that process of quitting, um, you know, their tobacco product, whether that's a cigarette or a e-cigarette vape, you know, something like that. And, and one thing I know one of our, um, cessation specialists had told us about was I can remember, she said she had a, um, young man who was 16 or 17 years old who would initially take a hit off a of vape. And then he would smoke a cigarette directly after it. So they're moving from vaping to cigarettes. And so with these cessation programs, what's really nice about it is that they're more like coaches and they do a team approach in order to come up with a plan. They create this action plan um, so that they can take steps to quit. They look at, you know, the withdrawal symptoms. They look at triggers. They look at all these different things. And it's usually about six to eight weeks, how long they're going through this program. So um, it are, is really a benefit. There are a number of evidence-based approaches um, and, and it's not one size fits all. So right. you know, we have an online program. We have a group counseling program. There are other text to quit programs. There are helplines. There are online programs. There are a number of different programs out there. The most important thing is for people to know, you know how to access those. There's also, you know, the behavior modification piece. You learned how to use those products. You need to unlearn that or learn how to replace that behavior with something else. So that behavior modification approach is, is certainly um, significant as well. Um, I also want to just based on what you said too, Erin, there's a lot of, and maybe this kind of comes full circle from what we were talking about with Great American Smokeout. It's important for people to recognize that quitting means quitting all tobacco use. It doesn't mean switching. Right. Um, initially, as those products were out in the field, there was a big push for, you know, harm reduction or that, you know, people, if they used e-cigarettes, that was a way to quit. They, they haven't really quit. They've just switched to a different product. And we are finding more and more that are using, they start off with e-cigarettes and then advance onto other types of tobacco products as well. So it's important for any of those quit resources to make sure that they're addressing all types of tobacco, not just e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And for youth specifically, there are specific 
resources out there for youth. One is teen.smokefree.gov, and that includes a ton of information specifically for teens about quitting the risks. It includes text lines, hotlines. Um, I know on our help app, we have all those text lines and helplines like the Quit Start app. Um, and there's like tons and tons of different text lines that you can text and they can help you make those plans, help you take those steps, even if it's just quitting for a day and just be like, let's see if we can do one day and let's see if we can do two. And from there, you know, try and just stop forever. Mm -hmm. The Lung Association just a couple months ago launched our Not For Me program, which is based on, we've had a, a youth cessation program called Not On Tobacco that has been around for over 25 years, evidence-based program. And we modified that program to incorporate more emphasis on vaping products, but really on all tobacco products, but it's now moved online and it's a free, um, a free available resource for teens to log on independently, self-guided. It's at notforme.org. So very accessible and just another option out there in the suite of, of options for, for youth to be able to quit. And so Jasmine and Melissa, what do you guys think it would take for, you know, somebody, you know, to stop vaping? Is it a teacher, a coach, or is it like their friends who are like, this is not cool anymore. You got to stop this. I think serious consequences because they get away with it so easily. So I feel like if something were there to tell them that if you don't stop this, like this is going to happen or you're going to have to go through this or something like that. And it doesn't have to be to that extreme either. It could be just, I, I know I, personally, when someone tells me that they're disappointed in me, I, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, wow, like I need to like change, like what I did wrong. Like maybe just someone telling them like, I'm disappointed that you're doing this could really be the factor that they need to put down the vape. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I think that in order to help somebody quit, I think they would have to go through like a whole, like Jasmine said, uh, having a, you know, a, a kind of format of like consequences of what would happen if this habit continued and what changes would happen to you and how it would affect your life negatively and try to point out the negative side effects of this because there are no positive long-term effects that are going to benefit you in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only the health consequences of it, but one thing I know that I like to talk to youth about is money and how much money you spend, whether it's on a vape or whether it's on cigarettes, it's very, very expensive. So I tend to, when I'm talking to kids and doing programs, I tend to talk about how much it would cost for a year and then have them tell me what they would rather buy with that money, you know? And so depending on the age, you know, they're talking about wanting to buy clothes or they want to buy new video games or a new, you know, you could get a new iPhone every year for what it would cost to be addicted to tobacco, whether it's cigarettes or vapes. So, you know, money, health, there's so many negatives to using these products. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Jasmine and Alyssa, for coming on, for telling us what you guys are seeing in your schools and for giving us your perspective. Because um, unfortunately, the other three of us on this call are very, very far removed from all of that. So we appreciate you coming on today. And of course, thank you so much, Michelle, for coming on today, for Pleasure. telling us a little bit more about the American Lung Association. Um, and you know how these products can really impact not only our youth, but our adults in our community as well. Um, for more information and resources, please visit our website at njprevent.com forward slash positive youth. And we wanna thank you all for listening in. We'll see you next time for more youth positively speaking.